Hello and welcome to the Asian Peace Talks. This is a podcast series launched by the Asian Peace Program of the Asia Research Institute of the National University of Singapore. The goal of the Asian Peace Program is a noble one, to try to preserve and strengthen peace in Asia. With our limited resources, we have to take a modest approach. Nonetheless, just as a small acupuncture needle can make a big difference, we hope that our monthly policy essays and this new podcast series will make a big difference and strengthen the peace regimes in Asia. I am Kishore Mabubani, the host of the Asian Peace Talks. For the sixth episode of this podcast series, we are delighted to interview one of the foremost experts on Indian foreign policy, Professor Kanti Bajpai, to talk about India's relations with China and with Pakistan. Kanti Bajpai is Director of the Center on Asian and Globalization and the Wilma Professor of Asian Studies at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, he has previously taught at Oxford University, Jawaharlal Nehru University and the Maharaja Sayajirao University. He has also written extensively on India's foreign policy. His latest book is very insightful. It's a good read on India-China relations entitled India versus China, Why They're Not Friends and published in 2021. Thank you, Kanti, for joining us. Today, we're going to start talking about India and Pakistan. But let me just tell our audience that we are doing this against the backdrop of a truly major war that has suddenly broken out in our times, the Ukraine war. And what's happening in Ukraine shows the importance of actually trying to anticipate and prevent wars. And in Asia, two of the most dangerous fault lines are clearly the ones between India and China and India and Pakistan. Indeed, none of us will be surprised if suddenly there's a skirmish or incident because these are very dangerous borders. So the goal of this uh, Asian Peace Talks podcast series and the goal of our discussion today, Kanti, is to try and figure out, maybe through small measures, what can we do to make the situation less dangerous. And certainly in the case of India-Pakistan, I'm going to start with that, I'm always very puzzled that these two neighbouring countries barely trade with one another. And to explain why that is abnormal, I'm just going to compare it with two other countries of about the same size, you know. China is all as populous as India. Vietnam is almost as populous as Pakistan. And if you look at India-Pakistan trade, it was like 200 million in the year 2000. Barely grew to 300 million in 2020. Whereas by contrast, China-Vietnam trade went up from 2.5 billion in 2000 to 162 billion in 2020, an increase of 65 times. So what's happening between China and Vietnam, I think, is normal, even though they're adversarial states. Whereas what's happened within India and Pakistan is abnormal. So why, Kanti, is there no trade within India and Pakistan? Well, partly it's history. Uh, they stopped trading a long time ago as a result of their conflicts. But I think that a deeper problem is that in Pakistan, there's suspicion over trade and what trade might do. And I think that's the real kind of hurdle to sustain bilateral trade, growing trade between the, the two sides. And I think the fear on the Pakistani side is that as the weaker economy, it would become dependent on the India trade and that that might translate into political influence uh, within Pakistan. And so I think that's the greatest resistance to trade. It's not so much from domestic interests in Pakistan, that is trading interests, business interests, who see Indian producers as being rivalrous, although they do produce some of the same things, agricultural products uh, and so on. But I think that's the, the basis for the resistance on the Pakistani side. It's not as if there's no resistance on the Indian side. Uh, from time to time, when there are political problems between the two sides, India also seems to back off on the trade issue. And that's the situation at the moment. There is hesitancy on both sides, more marked on the Pakistani side, because it's mixed up with the political strategic relationship with India. And so I think 
if trade is to resume and become the basis for a friendlier relationship, we have to find a way to get Pakistan past its its kind of reluctance to trade with India. Yeah. That's what I hope we will try to do in our discussion today. Because what you just said about the suspicions uh, on the Pakistan side that India will gain more from trade and Pakistan will become dependent on India for trade reminds me of my early days of attending ASEAN meetings in the 1970s in Southeast Asia. And there was also this lingering suspicion, I can tell you, especially within Indonesia and Singapore. And you know, Indonesia is a much bigger country, of course. Indonesia always fell. If it, if it traded with Singapore, Singapore would take all the gains and Indonesia would get none of the gains. So I can tell you, it took us almost a decade or two to persuade the Indonesians that actually, if you do trade, Indonesia could actually gain more. <laughs> and that's, that has now been proven by developments. And Indonesia as a country used to also have the, the mentality of many third world countries in the 60s and 70s that external trade was exploitative and that the rich guys would win and the poor guys would lose. But of course, the story of East Asia has shown that it's the opposite that has happened. That actually is the poor countries have benefited a lot from trade and they've actually managed to eliminate poverty uh, through trading. So the whole mindset in East Asia, as you know now, is towards going for more trade because they believe that that's the fastest way of economic growth. You know, I, and I met many of the senior Pakistanis and the senior Indians also. And they are, as you know, among the most successful people in the advanced societies, especially in the United States. And some of the best economists in the world actually come from India and, and Pakistan. As you know, the, the UN, I think it was called the Development Report, was a partnership between Amatya Sen of India and Mabubul Haq of Pakistan. Yes, correct. Not mistaken. correct. So, you know, they produce the best economists, and yet they cannot persuade their own countries that trade is not a zero-sum game. Trade is a win-win game. So if we had to try and persuade these Pakistani policymakers, what kind of arguments would you use with them to say, hey, you're not shooting yourself in the foot, you're actually going to make your country stronger? Well, one of the examples, uh, I think, to give to the Pakistanis particularly is the example of Bangladesh, mm -hmm. which uh, has now a pretty robust trading agreement with India and uh, an, a growing volume of trade. And in return, India provides surplus power, for instance, to, uh, to Bangladesh. So I think that's the, the kind of point that might be made to Pakistani rulers to show that it's a win-win. And there were tensions between India and Bangladesh historically as well. But they've moved on, I think. The Bangladeshis have moved on, the Indians have moved on. I think the other point to make to the Pakistani side is that actually, if they're worried about influence and dependency, in trade there tends to be a kind of joint dependency. Those who are exporting to Pakistan from India get locked into the Pakistani market. And so they have a stake in continuing to have good relations with Pakistan so that their products can flow to Pakistani consumers. So I think it's not just a matter of, you know, Indian producers infiltrating, as it were, the Pakistani market, but it's Indian producers becoming dependent on the Pakistani market uh, for their products. And so it seems to me if, if it's put that way, then it uh, might shine a slightly different light on the, the opportunities of trade for the Pakistanis. I think too, probably, both sides have to do a better job of dramatizing the gains from trade. I think the experts on both sides, as you point out, can tell the story very vividly in terms of the gains. But that story is not getting out to the, the larger mass of people. And I think the public diplomacy on both sides simply has to be better to get that story out, to explicate things to people, uh, to get buy-ins in a much larger sense. And there are particular constituencies that would have to be softened up, so to speak. By the way, on the Pakistani side, that probably includes the Pakistani military. But the promise there is that the Pakistani military, unlike the Indian, has its fingers in a lot of businesses. And therefore, you know, they, they could see their way to seeing opportunities for them in trade with India as well. And some canny 
Uh, you're always talking about shrewdness of policy, some canny and shrewd Indian policies directing trade uh, possibly towards some of these Pakistani army uh, enterprises uh, might lubricate the, the relationship. Uh, I'm glad that the thunder is uh, entering into our conversation. The rain is imminent and the gods are agreeing with our points. <laughs> I hope so. I hope they're not angry with what I'm saying. No, <laughs> it's an auspicious sign when it rains. <laughs> but just to reinforce your point on um, Bangladesh, to give you the data, in the year 2000, when trade within India and Pakistan was 200 million, it was 900 million within India and Bangladesh. Now it's grown to almost 10 billion uh, by 2019. And what is even more striking about the Bangladesh story is that everyone knows that India is an economic miracle growth story, but they don't realize that, Pakistan, that Bangladesh itself uh, went from least developed status in the United Nations uh, to having a per capita income higher than India, <laughs> uh, I think in 2020. So that's a remarkable growth story. And it actually shows that if uh, Pakistan had emulated uh, Bangladesh, actually Pakistan would also be a much stronger uh, economy than it is today, and frankly, less vulnerable in terms of having to go to IMF uh, every decade or so and say, please help the Pakistan economy. That actually, that it would, Pakistan would protect itself by doing, uh, doing that. But at the end of the day, as you yourself said, it's a question of persuading the right people in, in Pakistan. And here I wonder, uh, you mentioned the military what would you say are the attitudes of the military in terms of trade uh, with India? Just uh, uh, before I answer that, I just want to say one more word about uh, Pakistan and its attitude towards trade. I think in many ways, Pakistan may be better placed to be an export-driven economy than Bangladesh. Uh, its geographical position is brilliant, right next to the oil-producing countries of the Gulf. It opens up also to Africa, East Africa, and of course the Indian seaboard. Um, and now with the China-Pakistan economic corridor, it's tremendously linked also to China, which is you know a stupendous market for its products. Bangladesh has none of those advantages, but their own reforms place them in a position to be effective in the global uh, economic system. So I think the other case to be made to Pakistan is a fundamental reorientation towards an export-led economy. And they could learn something from Bangladesh and really capitalize on their location and their strengths. So it seems to me that would be part of how to make the case to Pakistan. As far as the Pakistan... I agree with you completely. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a striking f geographical factor and uh, hasn't really been played up enough, probably. And the Pakistani elites haven't quite internalized that view themselves. Um, but as far as the Pakistani army goes, so it's been changeable. I think there are times when the military has been the block on trade with India. There are other times we hear, uh, it's always difficult to know exactly, but, but at other times they've been far more positive than... Pakistani businesses or Pakistani politicians. Uh, so it seems to vary, and it's not quite clear why it varies. Perhaps when it's headed by a more liberal faction of the military, it's more pro-trade. When it is more conservative, then it's more conservative on trade as well. Uh, but it seems to me, it's contrary to a lot of the Western and even Indian portrayal of the Pakistani military, it's a rational military. They think very clearly, strategically, and politically. They haven't been at the helm of affairs in Pakistan for 60 to 70 years without being very clever, long-term thinkers. And so I think they've done their homework and they know what the substantial gains from trade may be. So the, the hurdle, I think, for the Pakistani army too is that they need to trade off a more positive view on trade with India for some kind of political diplomatic gain on issues that, you know, for 70 years have been so vital. And here we come to the territorial issue, the K word, Kashmir, and, and all of that. Now, I know in this series, uh, we don't want to get to the most elemental, big conflict story and how it can be solved. But I think 
there is an opportunity for India to try to meet that concern in the Pakistani army of some concession that they can take back to the Pakistani public, to elements of the Pakistani officers corps mm-hmm. and say, you know, we're going to open up on trade. The Indians have at least given us this. Mm-hmm. And I think there's the prospect of, of, of that being done. It would mm-hmm. be a very rational way to proceed for both sides. Mm-hmm. I think uh, when you were speaking earlier, Kanti, you mentioned that um, there could be some kind of compromises on Siachen and Sakrik. Do you want to briefly mention what those concessions might be and why you think they would actually benefit both India and Pakistan? Yeah. Um, so Siachen, just a, very briefly, is a, a glacier, sometimes referred to as the third pole. It's so massive. Uh, it's in Kashmir and it's at a height of about 13,000 feet, thereabouts. Wow. Uh, it's an impossible, unhospitable place. The troops there uh, die by the cold and the rare atmosphere and they fall through crevices and so on on both sides. There's practically no fighting there. It's very hard to imagine what the tactical or strategic advantage of their positioning up there is. Although the case was made that they could stop each other from all kinds of military maneuvers. Uh, But at 13,000 feet, when you can barely breathe, it's hard to imagine what Mm -hmm. breakthrough attacks could occur there. So it seems to me that the agreements that the two sides forged in the early 1990s, 1993 in fact, uh, could be pulled out of the drawers and activated. And the agreement essentially was that both would pull away from the glacier, pull their troops away from forward positions in the glacier into more hospitable terrain. They would perhaps deploy mechanical uh, remote uh, sensors on the ground and increasingly be able to check things out with their satellites, especially the Indians. And that the threat there was that if anyone broke the agreement, then they would quickly send their troops back in. I think that's a perfectly reasonable proposition. And with the improvements in technology, it becomes ever more rational uh, and sensible to do. So I think that's the kind of gesture that would give the Pakistani army a kind of small victory that they could take back to energize the trade agreement with India. Sir Creek is, of course, it's a creek, so it's way down river. uh, near. It opens out into the Arabian Sea, and it's contested, obviously. There's a solution. Again, they initialed an agreement in 1993, and the simple proposition or solution there is drawing a line down the midway point of the creek, which is more or less in consonance with international law, as I understand it. And this line would extend somewhat into the Bay of Bengal because there's a maritime boundary there as well. And that's, uh, sorry, not the Bay of Bengal, the Arabian Sea. So that's the solution there. They signed it. They pulled back from it. India pulled back from it before Pakistan did. But it's waiting to be resurrected. And I think that's another quick win. It doesn't involve any movement of or dislocation of people. To the ordinary Indian... (laughs) They can't even identify Sir Creek. I don't know how many Pakistanis can. It would just be another small win, showing reasonableness on both sides. And again, allowing the Pakistanis to take home a small concession from India, which would again, hopefully vivify and energize trade. So it seems to me there's the basis for you know, giving expression to something you've always championed, which is let's at least get something going on trade, see where it leads. It might soften up the relationship for broader engagement. Your your two suggestions uh, on Sir Creek and Siachen is are exactly along the lines of what the Asian Peace Program tries to do: look for small improvements that can actually, like, like an acupuncture needle, make a, a a big difference. But before that, you said something I think equally important. When you said something that most listeners will be surprised to hear, which is that the Pakistani military is a very rational body and thinks carefully and long term. So I hope that some members of the Pakistani military will listen to this podcast and understand that what we are trying to do here is put across rational suggestions that will actually benefit Pakistan and benefit India. Because trade is always a win-win game. And and I want to, ju- before we switch to uh, China, India and China, I want to make an, another very important point, reinforcing again your point you made, which is that any objective economist looking at Pakistan's population, resources and everything would say that 
Pakistan has the potential to become the new South Korea of Asia. And therefore, Pakistan actually may be a country that may have one of the biggest gaps between its potential and its performance. But to get there towards becoming a South Korea, I guess it's got to become like the other East Asian countries and open up its economy, do more trade. And frankly, at the end of the day, you'll have a stronger Pakistan economy, which will, of course, mean a stronger Pakistan military. <laughs> so there's an alignment of interest there if they want to go down that uh, route. But let me, let's me now switch to India and China, where you have an interesting kind of a mirror relationship where if the Pakistanis fear that they're dealing with a much bigger neighbor <laughs> in India, I think Indians have a similar fear that they're having dealing with a much bigger neighbor in China. I mean, the populations are about the same, but as you always say, uh, China's economy, which used to be about the same size as India in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, China's economy is now five times at least larger than uh, India's economy. So it's a, again that you have the obverse side down there. And here, if you're looking for low-hanging fruit uh, on the India-China front, what are the things that both sides can do? And of course, you know, you and I have discussed this before, actually, that, that at least twice the Chinese leaders have proposed to India, why don't we just live with the status quo? <laughs> I think Zhou Enlai made that proposal and Deng Xiaoping made that proposal. So in some ways, it's funny that this is a sensible, rational uh, suggestion that the Chinese government made many, many years ago. Unfortunately, it hasn't surfaced again. But let's go back to that suggestion what do you think? Is that is that suggestion still a possible way out in terms of diffusing the tensions within China and India? I think it is, actually. Mm. You know, it's received a lot of bad press mm. in the years after Deng Xiaoping made the offer as late as 1983-84, and India turned it down at that time as well. And it seems that both sides have pulled away from that completely. But it is really... In terms of solutions, the elephant in the room, even now, given the geography, given the size of these two countries, given the almost impossibility again of extensive military operations at those Himalayan heights, it would really seem like the swap deal is the only way to go. So for listeners, I just want to say a word about what the swap yes, is. Yes, please, please explain, yes. So the India-China boundary is, it varies in estimations of length, but it, it's several thousand kilometers long. But it's divided into three sectors. There's the western sector in Ladakh. There's a small central sector in the northern Indian state of Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh, which is not very problematic in terms of the differences between the two countries. And then there's the eastern sector, which borders Arunachal Pradesh, which the Chinese call South Tibet. That's the most substantial territorial claim in terms of land area, amounting to about 90,000 square kilometers. In Aksai Chin, it's about 30,000 square kilometers. The swap deal that was proposed by Zhou Enlai in 1960, and thereafter by Deng Xiaoping, was that India would accept the Chinese claim in Aksai Chin. China uh, controls Aksai Chin anyway. Mm. Uh, but it would legally so and formally side accept it. will have to give up any territory they don't control. Exactly. Yes. If the swap went through. So yeah. China would stick with its claims to uh, Aksai Chin and have it under their control. And the Indians would get Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which they control at present. So in that sense, there's, there's no change in, in alignments. And in terms of your formula of freeze the quarrel, in a sense, uh, this is what it speaks to. It ran into trouble because... It's complicated, but essentially the Indians were worried about a couple of things. The first was whether China would actually finally deliver on it despite the offer, uh, since it had never really been written down on a piece of paper, it wasn't very official and so on. The second was that Indian domestic politics seemed to get in the way. Even Jawaharlal Nehru, at the peak of his power, wondered whether his own party, the Congress party, as well as the opposition and public opinion would accept a swap when they had been told for years that they owned both chunks of territory. So what looks like a reasonable status quo position today, in those days it looked like India would have to give up Aksai Chin for holding on 
to Arunachal. So giving up territory, especially, I suppose one can understand it, India had just been partitioned as well. So in a sense, it had lost two huge chunks of territory in West Pakistan and East Pakistan. So there were probably very great sensitivities at that point to then giving up even more territory. Uh, nonetheless, to come back to the swap, that's what the swap is. Uh, China gets Aksai Chin and India gets Arunachal Pradesh. Since then, things have got a bit more complicated, not just because India rejected the deal, because, but because it seems like China has developed some greater concerns now, particularly about the eastern sector, which is Arunachal Pradesh. And here, the Tawang Monastery is quite an important problem. Uh, it is very significant for Tibetan Buddhism, and the Chinese would ideally like to have it as part of Tibet, part of China. And the Indians, you know, find it very difficult to countenance giving it up, quote-unquote. Nonetheless, the swap is really the elephant in the room in terms of, with some adjustments, that original idea of Zhou Enlai uh, could, still, could still work. And the 2005 agreement between the two sides, it didn't quite give expression to the swap, it said that every sector would be worked out on its own merit. Uh, but, uh, and this is the package deal, no deal in any sector would be formalized until they agreed in all the sectors. So they couldn't do, let's say, an agreement on the eastern sector and then await agreement in the other two. Uh, they had to do each sector on its own merit and then having got agreement on all the sectors, then they would have a final settlement. And that's what's proved tricky. It's still plausible to do, and most well-informed observers say that the real differences in e across all these sectors comes down to 15 or 20 enclaves where they have concerns. So again, from the perspective of this program, the Asian Peace Program, it does seem like these are quite small differences, quite bridgeable, and then you would have an overall agreement. Um, and I think it just takes doing them one by one by one to get an agreement. Now, that's easier said than it's done, but that's, that's the way it's going to be done uh, eventually. I think it's quite plausible, but a certain amount of domestic uh, preparation. Uh, preparation of public opinion is, is required on both sides, mm. particularly on the Indian side. Uh, as you know, in your book on China, you actually cite something I told you which is what a Chinese diplomat told me that when he was involved in negotiations with Indian diplomats, each discussion would begin with the Indian diplomat saying, you know, China had proposed that we go with the status quo. Why doesn't China propose it again? And of course, the Chinese response, which may have been either cheeky or ingenious, was to the Indians, why didn't you accept it when we first proposed it? Which actually, it does imply that if the Indians had accepted it, the deal would have been made. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, I would say that the uh, the deal is a real possibility. And that actually brings out the real tragedy in the China-India uh, relationship, right? Unlike the case of Ukraine, for example, right? Where it is really a very direct clash between the desire of the Ukrainians to join NATO and the Russian line that I, over my dead body. You can see that those are truly irreconcilable differences. But when you come to the China-India border, essentially both sides have more or less accepted that the status quo in one way or another, with adjustments here and there, will be the big answer. So if you can even just get an in-principle agreement that yes, okay, at the end of the day, it will be an agreement based on the status quo. That, I think, would immediately clear the poison or the toxic dimensions in the uh, China-India relationship. Of course, this requires very strong leaders uh, on both sides. And this is the paradox. If ever there was a moment <laughs> in the China-India relationship where you have simultaneously strong leaders in India and China, it is today. I mean, Narendra Modi, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, like him, dislike him, you have to acknowledge he's a very strong and powerful leader, especially after now winning UP big time. <laughs> uh, at the same time, Xi Jinping has probably been the strongest leader that China has had since Mao and Deng. So this, this creates a real window of opportunity
So do you do you see that as at some point in time a possibility of someone mentioning to these two leaders that actually their legacy will be far greater if the two of them could solve a major problem with something simple and commonsensical? I think that's a possibility. I think they're both aware of it. Mm-hmm. I think we both know both Modi and and Chi are aware of it. I think so. I mean, I, and they're both very legacy-minded people mm. from everything we can see. Uh, Xi Jinping has stated, I think, very clearly that he hopes his legacy will be the solution of several of these territorial problems or integration problems for China, ta- be it Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Tibet, Xinjiang, uh, and so on. So he's very. Uh, very, very public about that being his gift to mm. the Chinese nation. Um, and I think Modi, at least in 2014, he started out with something like that view. He made gestures towards Pakistan. He made gestures towards China. And uh, so I think he, and he's a man who wants to go down in history. It's very clear. He wants to supplant virtually all the earlier leaders of India in the pantheon of leaders and so I think it's, it's very much the case that he has this sense of wanting to leave a, a great legacy. I think the question is, you know, how do we get both of them to pay enough attention to this issue, to activate this desire for a legacy beyond what's, uh, what they've done? I, I was thinking a little bit about uh, Henry Kissinger and his point uh, back in the Cold War about how the United States and Soviet Union had to, you know, from his studies of, the, the, of Europe uh, back in the 19th century, how the great powers worked a whole series of understandings, tacit and, and implicit, uh, little bargains and bigger ones, uh, setting a kind of constraints on their own behavior and, and, and thereby managing a kind of balance of power system. Um, and I think something like that is what India and China need. And to be fair to them, uh, the last 30 or 40 years, that's what they've been trying to do. Ever since Rajiv Gandhi went to Beijing in 1988 and met Deng Xiaoping, who put a, a, an arm around this younger uh, prime minister of India and said, you know, we must solve problems sensibly, let's, let's do it. And Rajiv broadly accepted the view. And by the way, one of the views he accepted was that it was important to normalize particularly the economic relationship. Uh, So I'll come back to that in a minute because it it relates also to the Pakistan case uh, somewhat. But as part of those negotiations over 40 years, they had a basket of discussions over the border, confidence building measures related to the military presence up in the Himalayas and several other issues, people to people contact. They had joint economic committees. Uh, They tried to encourage investment on both sides. Uh, Cultural kind of relationships were opened up again and so on. Um, And in the summits and their private talks, I think they began to develop an understanding around what they would not do beyond a point and what they would do up to a point. And I think that's the way in which you can get the relationship to the stage where they can do the bargain. So to illustrate it, uh, for instance, um, something like a set of bargains that looks like this. Um, You know, uh, India would come back to very fulsomely endorsing China's control of Tibet. In the last eight or ten years, India has gone silent on that endorsement. Um, So to return to that, uh, the Chinese could in return increasingly you know, affirm that uh, Kashmir must be dealt with by India and Pakistan in a, uh, in a peaceful way, which they endorsed in the past, but don't speak of much now. They could also endorse India's ownership, as it were, of Sikkim, which they did once or twice, and then they've kind of backed off from it as well. Uh, so there are sort of tacit understandings on these kinds of issues. Relationships with third parties. Mm-hmm. I think uh, the United States, of course, is, is, is that most important third party there. And I think there was a, a moment up to Galwan 2020, perhaps uh, in the wake particularly of the Doklam conflict in 2017, when India did try to show a certain degree of kind of restraint on the emerging Indo-Pacific idea and the Quad idea. You'll recall, for instance, that Modi came to Singapore 
first Indian prime minister to address the Shangri-La dialogue in 2018. And he said very clearly there that India endorsed the Indo-Pacific, but with the corollary that it had to be inclusive. And everyone read this, I think, quite clearly as a kind of a softening towards China to say that possibly China could be part of the Indo-Pacific. Now, that may or may not be possible, but it was a symbolic kind of gesture to China that India would not play a hardline role in trying to contain China as part of this coalition. So that's a kind of tacit public message to China, uh, which China could reciprocate in, in certain ways as well. Perhaps not calling India out every time over the Indo-Pacific would be a good beginning as a reciprocal gesture. Yeah. So it seems to me, you know, here are several kinds of things that they can come to an understanding about. There's a view uh, that has emerged in China that in return for, let's say, concessions on the Chinese side, what would India give in return that, you know, India couldn't take back? Uh, so if China made some concessions on the boundary, is there anything India could give China in return that w was not revocable? So there's some concern in China that they can't think of what it is that India could give them that India couldn't move away from. So uh, I mean, it's been said that perhaps India would move further away from its strategic partnership with the Americans in return. But clearly India could say that one day and then go back to being closer to the Americans the next day. So I think there's a little bit of a trick that has to be worked out there, which is what is that India gives substantially, which it can't then take back. Uh, I think the genius of Modi and Xi Jinping would be to find that. Yeah, but I think here somebody else who could guide us, actually, I'm glad you mentioned him, is Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and, you know, Henry Kissinger will go down in history. For the most brilliant move he made was to, in a sense, separate... China from the Soviet Union. And it's a very basic law of geopolitics, which is that when you have three powers, the one power that has closer relationships with the two other powers and situates itself in the middle has the greatest leverage. And Kissinger and Nixon played that brilliantly by going to China and detaching China from its alliance with the Soviet Union. And, and then after visiting China in 72, they went to Moscow in 73 and said, we also talk to you. And that way they, the Americans positioned themselves in the middle. And today, if there is one power that can actually position itself in the middle in what is going to be the great triangle of the 21st century of the United States, China and India, the country that has the greatest opportunity to position itself in the middle is India, right? India can actually develop good relations with the United States, which it has, and India can also develop good relations with China and then position itself in the middle, and that will give it tremendous leverage in these coming decades. But what puzzles me is that, there, you know, there are lots of good Indian strategic thinkers, but almost no one is suggesting that India be as crafty as, as Kissinger and Nixon and move itself away from its way, its current position, which is clearly more closely aligned with the United States than with China. And here, in some ways, it's good that you and I are talking after the debate in the UN on Ukraine, because I've now spoken to, directly or indirectly, to several Americans who have said to me that they are shocked that India did not support United States and did not do the right thing on Ukraine and actually abstained uh, on Russia. And the thing about that event, I think it's, it's probably a wake-up call for New Delhi that sometimes if you get close to the United States, it actually expects you to do things that may be against your own national interests. So perhaps being in the middle may actually give India more leverage in Washington, D.C., than actually getting too close to Washington, D.C. So is there anyone in India who's advocating that, hey, let's learn from Kissinger and Nixon, let's go to the middle position? That gives us the biggest advantage. Well, you know, Kissinger is not always the, the best name to invoke for Indian uh, strategic thinking. <laughs> yes, Al although there are fans 1971. Of, yeah, so there are fans of Kissinger, of course. Uh, but, uh, but I think it, actually India has its own strategic culture of doing mm. that. Mm -hmm. It was called non-alignment. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, now, sometimes we play the non-alignment game better and sometimes worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes we couldn't play it very effectively and sometimes we could. Mm-hmm. But it was that middle position. And um, a long time ago, the e- uh, economist, I think it was Michael Kalecki, mm-hmm. uh, back in the Cold War days, said that India uh, was milking both cows, <laughs> is how he put it. Uh, extracting... That's the best position to be. <laughs> yeah, and cows is quite uh, evocative for uh, uh, <laughs> India. Uh, so... You know, I think that tradition still exists. Um, and it's called strategic autonomy now, apparently, in India. So, uh, But it is a, a position where India exploits the, the space between two powers. Uh, and how does it do it? It does it by threatening to defect permanently to one side or the other. So what India, in effect, is messaging both China and the United States is don't push us too hard on anything because we'll go over completely to the other side. I mean, we might tilt this way or that way occasionally, but if you push us too hard, we will go over completely to the other side and presumably that would be bad news for, for you. Mm-hmm. So I think it's that's the position that India does in fact play. And you can see it actually. One way of, I was saying earlier, how Modi in Shangri-La kept a, a mm. line of, of communication open to With China. China yeah, yeah. That was kind of that messaging that, you know, he might have been signaling the Western allies and Japan, don't push us too hard, we might just pally up to China here. And I think when he gets too much pressure, or India gets too much pressure from the Chinese, in the wake of, say, Galwan 2020, that fracas that occurred two summers ago, then India tilts, you know, firmly. Uh, to the quad partners. So that's a reminder to the Chinese, don't push us too hard, we may go into almost an alliance with our Western partners. So I think India is trying to do that. So that's the first point. I think it has its own tradition, a non-Kissingerian position uh, of exploiting the space between. The second point I think to make is that if you read the recent uh, Russia-China statement, Mm -hmm. February 4th, I think, between Xi Jinping and Mm -hmm. uh, Putin, the 5,000 words statement. Yeah, if you read that, up to the point where they criticize the uh, Indo-Pacific, free and open Indo-Pacific and the Quad, there's nothing there that India would disagree with. They complain about, you know, the prevailing international order dominated by the Western powers. Mm-hmm. They reject democracy promotion. Uh, they, uh, you know, kind of point fingers at hypocrisy over human rights uh, and so on and so forth perhaps even some of the economic kinds of uh, positions that are associated with the Western powers. Greater equality in the in international institutions. All of those are bread and butter of Indian diplomacy as well. Until it gets to the point, that statement, where, you know, the, the two powers take aim at the Indo-Pacific, there's no problem for India. So I think there's a kind of broad attachment to a view of a multipolar international order that is not quite what we have today that India, China and even Russia can agree on. And I think one of the reasons India has been quite neutral in its statements over Russia, Ukraine is that, in fact, India is quite close to the Russian position broadly on international order, its skepticism about the liberal international order. So that means that, you know, there is this kind of feeling in India that uh, it can play both sides. It has something in common with both sides and uh, will not be drawn permanently into one camp or the other. I think it has to sell that proposition better to probably the Chinese in particular. I think the Russians have a better understanding of it. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, the one other dimension that has, again has emerged in this Ukraine episode is that I think, and I say this as someone who's a former ambassador to the UN, I can well understand why the Indians believe that if it comes to the crunch... And if they need a veto, and they may need a veto sometimes in the Security Council, of the five, I have no doubt that the ones that the Indians can trust the most by far will be Russia. There's a certain degree of chemistry, I find, you know, within the Russians and the Indians. There's a certain degree of trust and confidence in each other. And both of them sort of understand, you know, in, in, I don't have to describe it, but there's there. And clearly, I mean, India cannot rely on a Chinese veto. That's impossible. And the United States will not offer its veto to any other country. It doesn't need anybody else. 
And I was surprised to read a Straits Times article saying that India could turn to France for a veto. The French have not used their veto for decades because I one less one thing I learned as ambassador to the UN uh, is that UK and France will never use their veto alone because if they do so, their seat becomes in jeopardy because people will say, "Why are you giving a veto? Let's get you out now." And actually, that that's why the British and French voluntarily have taken away the veto. So there are no five vetoes in the Security Council. There are only three left now. And so out of three, clearly the ones that India can trust the most is the Russian. So this is again another reason for India to develop a position of what's called strategic autonomy because that will be in the interest of, of India. And I think if India moves in that direction, then frankly, this could also lead to greater, more peaceful relations with its neighbours of China and also Pakistan, I suspect, too at the end of the day. So, so do you see that as a possible direction that India may go in? I mean, to enhance its own interests, I mean. Of course. I mean, I think uh, the, the relationship with Russia, as you portray it, is, is really crucial for that reason, also for the arms dependence uh, reason. In this particular episode, of course, the presence of 18,000 Indian students in the Ukraine meant that India had to be very cautious about its policy because it had to get those people out. Mm -hmm. And that did require cooperation from Moscow. And by the way, there are several thousand Indian students in Russia. Mm -hmm. So India cannot afford to uh, you know, alienate the Russians beyond a point. Um, but adding all that together, I mean, and, and as you say, the kind of cultural, and I mean strategic cultural comfort with Russia, the veto, the, the kind of broad understanding or discomfort with an order that's dominated completely by Western powers, all of that, uh, and a, a warmth that was built up over 50 or 60 years. I think all that does mean that India will not allow the relationship to collapse with the Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, another reason for that, of course, and it speaks to the China issue, is that Delhi does not want Moscow to go, as it were, completely over to Beijing side. And so it wants to have you know it wants to provide a space for the russians to continue to to be close to india as well and not go too far into the chinese camp russia's recent uh, rapprochement with pakistan also is worrisome to delhi so there are a lot more reasons i think why india has to play very careful with with the russians uh, and as i say coming back to the issue of india playing in the space between powers i think that applies also to india between russia and, and the west if the Russians push too hard, then uh, India would want to uh, remind the, the Russians that uh, India has other options. And if the West pushes India too hard, then it needs to be reminded that India could go over to the other side, the Chinese and, and Russian side. So I think that India will continue to play that card. I can't see India being knocked off this perch of uh, kind of a middle position. And it speaks a little bit to an issue we haven't talked about because it's a bit abstract and all of that. but. There's kind of a civilizational pride and positioning of India, you know. It just looks at itself as being too big, with a very long history of its own glorious past and so on. And if it looks to the future, it sees a destiny as one of the biggest players in global affairs. And I don't think that, you know, from ordinary Indians to India's elite to India's political leadership, anybody would want to give up that, that kind of... Um, image of India, you know, to become a junior partner of this power or that power. And by the way, that cuts across the ideological divide in India. Nehru would not have countenanced that. I don't think Mr. Modi on the right wing would countenance that. And even the the left wing, the communists and so on, who are between those two poles, as it were, wouldn't countenance that. Mm. So there's a very strong civilizational sense in India, rightly or wrongly. I mean, you know, that they w are oh. not going to carry anyone else's water. Yeah. Well, if, if there's uh, one thing that both you and I can speak about with some confidence, it's Indian civilization. So since both you and I are children <laughs> of Indian civilization, and, and there's a I, bit of an argumentative I, Indian uh, <laughs> right. sort of, you know, resistance to... Uh, <laughs> that's right. And, and, and actually, I do think that, you know, in, in going to, even to, to an even larger context in terms of where the world is heading in the 21st century, we are clearly heading towards a multipolar world. 
uh, today away from the bipolar world, the Cold War, and the unipolar world of the post-Cold War era. And if there's one power that can actually play a useful role in terms of creating systemic stability among all the major powers. And if there's one power that can talk to Washington, D.C., talk to London, France, Moscow, Beijing, actually it should be India. So India actually has a tremendous geopolitical opportunity to position itself in the middle, not just between the United States and China, but also to position itself in the middle in a, in a multipolar world. But that requires, paradoxically, even greater civilizational confidence than what India has today. But I see that great opportunity for India. And if India positions itself in the middle, in a multipolar, multi-civilizational world, that will enhance the opportunities for India to create peace in its neighborhood. I mean, don't you agree with that? I agree with that. And I think the really central issue is... India's economic growth and its sort of comprehensive national power comes back a little bit to the China issue. India's one-fifth the size of China's GDP and, you know, it has to get its mojo back, its confidence back by bridging that gap. Partly, you know, as a reminder to China that India can stand up Mm -hmm. and should not be condescended to and pushed around, but also just to come back to a a place in world affairs where not just the Chinese, but the rest of the world also takes India more seriously. And I think some refurbishment of Indian power is absolutely vital. Mr. Modi has made a move towards greater self-sufficiency without, as he insists, giving up on maintaining an open economy. So he's hoping to kind of tap into investments and the flow of technology and all of that. And, and remind Indians to be competitive globally, but at the same time, he wants to build Indian economic strength and competence, mm-hmm. not just with respect to India's armed forces. So I think that's vital. If India can get its economic act together, then it'll be an inspiration to others as well, take India more seriously, from, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia. And I think it'll be a reminder to the big powers that India can sit at the big table in the chancelleries of power, as Nehru once said, mm. and uh, play that bridging role. And it's interesting that Subramaniam Jayashankar, who was formerly High Commissioner mm. in Singapore, you'll mm. remember, yes. and has gone on to be India's foreign minister, in his book, uh, The India Way, I must say I read it, I was a bit surprised by, but pleasantly surprised by, his gesture towards India going back to a natural constituency in what we used to call the non-aligned group and using that as a platform to act as a bridge. Mm. And I thought, here is Jay Shankar almost talking the language of Nehru. I mean, he's now foreign minister to Mr. Modi, who's not exactly a fan of Nehru, but he's talking that language. And he also emphasized what you did, which is yeah. it's going to be an increasingly multipolar world, not immediately, because the two great powers, the superpowers now stand out. Uh, but, you know, the, the elements of, the, of other powers rising certainly exist, including India. And so I think, you know, he's portraying that kind of world, which, which I think India is comfortable with. Multipolarized and India still leading a set of bridging powers who refuse to be drawn into op- oppositional camps and actively trying to, you know, reduce differences between clashing points of view. And so I think, yeah, I buy exactly what you say, which is that India can. And I think it, it's there, even in Mr. Modi. Unfortunately, the events of Galwan have made us lose sight of that fundamental kind of trajectory of Indian policy, uh, substratum of Indian policy. And I think it'll go, ba- it'll go back to it uh, as soon as it's, it's possible to do. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we are approaching the end of the hour <laughs> that we have set aside for our conversation, but I completely agree with you that if India gets its mojo back and becomes once again a very strong, dynamic, thriving economy and gets economic growth, and frankly, uh, this will of course be the subject of a different conversation that requires greater economic integration within India and East Asia, that requires India joining the uh, RCEP, you know, that's very, very critical. So we can come back to that, I suspect, and uh, I hope we can have a follow-up conversation sometime. But I want to thank you, Kanti. This has been a a fascinating conversation. I think for for most listeners, I suspect we have 
entered territory that is not familiar territory to many listeners and many of the issues that we have raised. In that sense, I think hopefully this discussion will help our listeners understand better, in a sense, the deeper roots of the problems between India and Pakistan and India and China and how we can, how they can be overcome, in a sense. I actually, at the end of the day, remain optimistic that you can have better relations between India and Pakistan and have better relations within China and India. But I hope that we, Kanti, will be able to uh, continue our conversation again. I want to conclude by thanking you very much for joining us today. And I also want to conclude by saying that the Asian Peace Talks podcast is brought to you by the Asian Peace Program, a part of the Asia Research Institute of the National University of Singapore. And I want to add here, very importantly, that Asian Peace Talks is produced and edited by Bertrand Sia and Dr. Varigonda Kesava Chandra. Please join me in thanking both Kanti and both of them. Thank you very much. Thank you.